There we go. Another successful landing. Things there. I like to make original videos, of which there's not another example of on uh, YouTube, and that is, this is certainly one of those. I'd like to be talking about a few proofs on uh, the ether, the important ones anyway. I've got a list of nearly 40, and I do mean that, um, 40 proofs on the ether. First, you need to make a bold and yet 100% undeniable statement, and I've said this many, many times before, that throughout all of human history, there has never been postulated any ultimate foundation. Um, you know, before you build a house, you lay a foundation, concrete and all that stuff. Never been postulated any fundamental foundation for cosmic mechanics other than two things, ever. There never has been other than these two. One has been the ether, and the other one has been atomism. I call it jokingly the cult of bumping particle. It believes that everything is a particle interaction. And if there's no evidence, and this is not hyperbole, if there's no evidence for these particles, and you can look this up too, by the way, they make up particles, and they call them virtual photons. They also too call them virtual particles. You can look that up. Um, current day quantum says, so what's going on in a magnet is the emission of virtual photons. Now, that's never been the input or output of any experiment ever done. It's completely conceptual with no basis in reality. Now, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. If you're an atomist, everything is a particle. Even if there's absolutely zero, and I mean this literally, please believe me and take a look for yourself on the internet. There's absolutely zero, not like 0 .001, there's absolutely 0, 0.0 to infinity evidence for any such nonsense as a virtual particle or a virtual photon. So like I said, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail, and these people think everything is atomistic. So there's something that no school or college has ever taught, no matter what position they take. Um, students, there's only ever been throughout all of human history only two postulates, the ether and atomism. There's never been more than those two. So, um, Getting on to proofs of the ether, I'd like to point out some of the uh, really, really important ones. Just a few. I think I'm going to hit on like five or six out of the list of 40 that I have. If people want another list of the additional um, 35 plus uh, proofs of the ether, let me know and I'll make a video. But I, I don't like to, you know, drone on unnecessarily on, you know, some of the other finer nuances. Um, specifically, let's get to fields, okay? Maxwellian field equations only define a field with a vector of period of time with a given result, such as joules, watts, volts, and seconds. If you ask any scientist, and trust me, you could take this up with any particle physicist or any, you know, I have a PhD in physics, theoretical physics. Just ask them. Say, excuse me, sir, what is a field? They will actually uh, guffaw and they'll say something uh, on the accord that, uh, something you could read directly out of Wikipedia, which is written by some of these people. A field or lines of force. And they love to say that. And they'll also say waves. Of course, there's no such thing as a wave because a wave is not what something is, but what something does. Lines of force. Lines are a conceptual abstraction. There's no such thing as a line. Yeah, A line of what? There are no lines. The lines that we actually see underneath the ferro cell or the supercell, for example, is just constructive and destructive interference between the magnetic and the dielectric. So they do see those lines, or like if you use iron filings um, on top of a piece of paper and put a magnet under it, which is what we've been doing for many hundreds of years. You see these blatant lines. That's no different than the ferro cell, just constructive de so That's where they actually came up with the lines thing from. But there's no actual lines in a field if you actually put them to that. And say, well, yeah, there's no real lines. Well, force, you know, force is something done by something upon something else. That's like saying happiness. There's no such thing as happiness. I mean, of course there is. People are happy. There's a thunder, lightning storm going on outside. The power might go out. I hope not. Um, but happiness is an attribute of something else. Anyway, these people, and I mean this emphatically, it's not my opinion or my feeling or my belief. These people cannot in any way, shape, or form tell you what a field is. That's just not a difficult question. You know, the famous, uh, and everybody should watch that video on YouTube. It's called Feynman Explains Magnetism. It's like a six-minute video. There's a thousand copies of it online, like a thousand. And, you know, he sits there and squirms. Well, what is magnetism? He sits there and squirms. I mean, this is the genius that these people think is, you know, the god of quantum mechanics and quantum physics. And I have his books. I've been through, uh, through them, especially his lectures. These people don't know, and it's okay not to know. 
but they can't tell you what a field is. And since everything is fields and fields are not particles, no way to know, know how, absolutely not, it's not my opinion, that's a fact, is another fundamental, key, foundational uh, proof of the ether, period. By the way, Michelson-Morley experiment did not disprove the ether. That would, I've made videos on this. There is an enormous amount of evidence actually out there about that fact, but the Michelson-Morley experiment was defunct. It did not disprove the ether in any way, shape, or form, and absolutely did not. It's completely ludicrous to even say that, and I get sick of people. What about the Michelson? Because I keep, I've heard that comment, oh God, probably a million times, it feels like anyway. Not a million, but it feels like that. Light. Everything in quantum, by their own admission, is based upon their understanding of light. They'll tell you it's, uh, as uh, Einstein called it, das Lichtwand. He says, and as the particles explains light, no two ways, but together they do. I call it a, a, a wave-particle duality, and of course there are no dualities in nature. Mother Nature doesn't deal in dualities, implying inherent contradiction. There are no contradictions in Natura Naturans or Mother Nature, and Mother Nature is just another, you know, conceptual abstraction for talking about fundamental, ultimate reality, of course. But light is not an emission. We all grew up, including me, thinking when you turned on a light switch, or oh, this uh, light bulb is emitting photons. It's emitting electromagnetic waves. We were all taught that, and that's completely ludicrous. Light is not an emission. And I will quote you now Nikola Tesla, who specifically said, light can be nothing other than a sound wave in the ether. Now, a sound wave is not an emission either. You know, people, every, we have speed of sound. And we all suffer this fundamental delusion that something has a speed and it's moving from here to here. Well, that speed is not a speed, it is the hysteresis of the medium, specifically the rate of induction. When I speak, yeah, I'm not emitting anything, I'm creating a perturbation. Wonderful word, everybody should learn, perturbation. In the medium, that being the air. Now, the speed of sound changes depending on air density, and air density, of course, changes depending on elevation and how hot it is and how cold it is. Cold air is denser. So the rate of propagation changes. Also, too, if there's like high humidity in the air, the rate of propagation of, ch of sound changes slightly. But sound is not an emission. Well, speed of sound, you know, break the sound barrier. Sure it is. No, sound's not an emission. That's what Nikola Tesla meant when he said sound. I mean, light can be nothing other than a sound wave in the ether. Well, Nikola Tesla was right. Einstein was wrong. It's not my opinion or feeling or belief. It's a fact. True scientists like Tesla, James Kirk Maxwell, Oliver Heaviside, Charles Proteus Steinmetz, these were true experts in field theory, not Einstein. He was not. Einstein was a plagiarist. Everything he stole actually came from several people, but primarily from Henri Poincaré. You can find a lot of his books free on archive.org. Let me repeat that name again. Henri Poincaré. So, these people, by their own admission, think that they understand light, and it's the foundation of what they think uh, they understand. It's emissions, particles, photons. Well, the photon idea is an abstraction from misunderstanding the coaxial nature of light, which is a refraction and compression along the dielectric. Yes, and that, of course, is just a compound ether perturbation modality, because that's all a field is, and I define that in my definitions, which, by the way, is a free download in the descriptions below. Um, a field is just an ether perturbation modality. It's literally that simple. But light disproves this particle nonsense. It's completely ludicrous. Light, you cannot explain lightly when light passes through glass. And of course, it's not passing, nothing is moving. It's the rate of induction or the perturbation. I mean, it changes its rate of uh, propagation. And propagation, once again, like using the word speed, implies something is moving from here to here. Well, it's not. It's the actual medium. The medium is uh, stalled. The hysteresis and rate of induction changes. Or as the current science will say, light slows down through glass. I mean, the type of glass, same with water, other things. They can never explain light speeding back up after it leaves said medium such as glass or water without breaking the law of conservation of energy. Because if you believe that light is photons or even an electromagnetic wave, of course, there's no such thing as waves. You just ask a size, well, what do you mean waves? There's no such thing as waves. Well, what are you talking about? Sure there is. Waves of what? Waves. Waves of what? It's like who's on first, what's on second. 
of the Abbott and Costello routine. Who's on first, what's on second? I don't know who's on third. I don't know if you've ever watched that before. That's old stuff. Yeah, it's even before my time, but everybody should watch that. It's completely hilarious. But light is a fundamental ether proof. The very definition and what fields are is an ether proof. Now, here's another one that's a lot more complicated and it would require an entire video for more. You need to look up Poincaré disk model of projective geometry. What is being projected? Even these, uh, these people in quantum and uh, particle physics, and the key word there is particle, and by the way, quantum, or das Lichtwand in Germany, in German, excuse me, in Germany, in German, uh, refers to a quantity. They don't believe in anything that cannot be quantized. There's no such thing, and by the way, this is really, really, really important, and no one ever talks about this. Quantum does not refer to anything in Mother Nature. There's no such thing as quantum. It's not electrical. It's not magnetic, it's not dielectric, it's not gravitational. It is these people's inability to fundamentally understand nature. They've come up with this neat, neat little word called quantum, and it refers to quantity. The smallest unit of quantification. And it, like a hammer, everything is a nail. If you're a mathematician, everything has to be counted. You, you can't understand or even fathom anything if you're a mathematician. If you can't quantize it, well, if I can't count it, I don't care about it. And today's physicists and scientists are not actual scientists by true definition, Aristotelian or Platonic, but they are as mathematicians, and they don't believe in anything you cannot quantize. They don't. Completely impossible. It's like talking about religion or something. Talking about God or religion or what's uh, transcendent. Uh, then you get in the realm of uh, philosophia, philosophy. Can't quantize it, then it's not real. It's like talking about uh, leprechauns and unicorns. Um, anyway, the Poincaré disk model of projective geometry is rather complex to explain, but everything has volume due to magnetism only, as I've actually said many times. So Poincaré disk model of projective geometry, and uh, the one thing that the New Age movement got right is that the entire universe is holographic. Well, I mean, how is it? And by the way, you can see if you've ever had your hands on a supercell or a feral cell, you're talking about uh, uh, nanoscale uh, levels of thickness, and yet you see incredible voluminous holographic uh, geometry that looks like you're looking at something with five inches of depth, and yet it's less than a tenth of a drop of liquid smashed between two optically flat pieces of glass. The holography on it's incredible. And uh, uh, the Poincaré disk model of projective geometry, and you should look that up, and there's many, many examples. There's a lot of math associated with it, which, you know, make most people's eyes cross, but the fundamentally understanding that the voluminous nature of the universe, because the voluminous nature of the universe is only extant because of magnetism only, because the after effect of a divergent magnetic field, like the loss of energy or inertia, the dielectric, manifests as magnetism, just as ice is a modality of water. Under a temperature condition, the actual, and of course ice expands too when it gets cold, um, the loss of energy or inertia in the dielectric manifests as magnetism, and that volume, if you will, the air of the balloon, this projective geometry of manifestation that gives volume to the entire universe, not even a single scientist on this earth has ever said, well, that volume is like, and this is really important. There's not a single, and this is the easy way to get these atomists, because most of them have never heard of the Poincaré disk model of projective geometry, but it's absolute undeniable reality as to the entire nature of the universe. And as I've said a thousand times of the toroidal geometry, that is magnetism, the volume you know, the after effect, which is space, and space has no properties, as Nikola Tesla said. The after effect, or the volume, or the air, because one thing the scientists did get right is, they said, well, every atom is 99.9999999% empty space. Actually not, it's an uh, electrostatic dynamo, and the volume in there is the after effect of magnetic effect, which is this projective geometry. It is magnetism, the after effect of a toroidal field. I mean, if you have magnetism as a toroidal field, which of course is what it is, the centrifugal uh, divergent vector of the loss of energy or inertia, the dielectric that we call, as human beings, call magnetism, what is the volume of that torus? Yeah? We all know a torus has volume, right? A donut. Well, what is the volume in there? Not a single scientist has ever said it's fields. I mean, of, uh, particles. Because it can't be. Well, what is it? What is holding up the balloon, if you will, of the toroidal after effect and in in measured in volume, or in case of an atom, measured in picometers? What is that volume? What is maintaining that volume? 
Well, it's the ether, because that loss of energy or inertia manifests as volume. This is what energy, and this is one of the fundamental secrets of the universe, and the conjugate geometry of the universe, regarding the magnetic and the dielectric, which are respectively the torus and the hyperboloid, is that loss of energy or inertia necessitates um, a different type of infinity. Um, the infinity of counter space of pure potential and uh, the empty infinity, which is what space is, space has no properties, it is empty, the after effect as manifest. And we have uh, ultimate reality of counter space and we have uh, the false reality of this holographic projection. Anyway, I don't want to get too super heavy into Poincaré model dis uh, projective geometry, but you should look at a Poincaré model of projective. It is absolutely incredibly important. It's something almost nobody talks about. And it's the one way to completely ruin, destroy, and obliterate this uh, neo, uh, this, uh, this uh, neo uh, crypto, actually, it's a crypto atomistic uh, view of modern physics and of quantum, is that it can never explain well, what's making up the volume of uh, you know, an atom, for example, uh, as measured in picometers. I mean, we all admit that an atom is basically nothing. It's like a supergiant beach ball, at the center of which is just something about the size of nothing, the nucleus of the atom. Well, you know, what is keeping uh, inflated this giant beach ball in the case of an atom? What about this projective geometry vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Poincaré? You know, it can't be atoms, you know, we can't have spontaneous generation. Um, I think some have postulated they've uh, tried to, uh, um, you know, support their own position. So it was virtual photons. And that's, of course, is what they say is happening outside of a magnet, is the emission of virtual photons, which has never been the input or output of any experiment ever done. It's purely conceptual with no basis in reality. It is arbitrary and is ludicrous. It would be no different than if I tried to explain some unknown phenomena with unicorns and leprechauns. I mean, if people believed me, then they would, of course, be crazy. And yet people believe you know, these uh, so-called scientists, which are not scientists, they're mathematicians and atomists, to say, well, it's what's happening on a magnet is the emission of virtual photons. Well, that's arbitrary, ridiculous, conceptual, and has no evidence nor basis of reality, and is ridiculous. Um, this one is even harder to try to explain than uh, Poincaré dismodal model projective geometry, and that's uh, harmonic uh, uh, incommensurability. Harmonic incommensurability could never, ever, and of course we have the logos of uh, spirit and matter, and of course scientists don't think that, uh, you know, there is a soul, like, there's no soul in the body. It's like, oh, I'm in complete agreement with you, but that's not a denial of the soul. There's no signal inside this radio, and there's no real fire inside this uh, iMac display. That's not the point. Harmonic incommensurability could never, ever, ever, be explained through some sort of atomistic model. And even if that's, they try to uh, employ uh, their, their, uh, their magic savior, the virtual photon, because you should do a Google search, by the way, on virtual photons. You will find that they, these people do say that, yes, a magnet is emitting virtual photons, virtual particles, same thing. It's ludicrous. It's asinine. It's okay for a scientist to not know. I would actually have a, a great deal of respect for them. Say, so, you know, we, we just some fundamental stuff we don't know. But the problem is, is that it's hubristic to say craziness. It's insane to say uh, craziness, but it's also too hubristic. And also, too, no one has ever gone looking for the answers to things that they already think they know the answer of. And these scientists are extremely, they're not real scientists, are extremely hubristic. Um, this is what's going on. It's just too complicated if you understand. It's the, the exchange of quantum virtual photons. It's like, what? I mean, a 10-year-old child, you know, understands that this is ludicrousness. It's just completely asinine. It's arbitrary, conceptual. It's, it's silliness. You know, it's like uh, reading a Dr. Seuss book or something. Um, but that is what they espouse. I mean, they, they do actually preach this nonsense. And that's not science. That's not even logical. It's akin to a religion. It's a belief system. It's not science at all. It's a belief system. Um, anyway, uh, harmonic incommensurability can never, ever, you couldn't even begin to explain it with atoms or particle interaction. It's completely impossible. And along that line, explaining life, the consubstantiality of matter and spirit, is again completely impossible to explain vis-a-vis -vis atomism. It's, it's ridiculous. You know, as much as you quantize the human body, and talk about the electrical signals in the brain, 
and uh, electrostatic interaction between muscles and whatnot of a living tissue. You could never, ever, ever explain light with atoms. It's completely impossible. Say, well, there's electrical impulses in the brain. Well, being initiated by what? You can never explain, for example, someone feeling happy or sad based upon, say, for example, an arbitrary vision of something completely unreal. Say a child is all of a sudden happy and has empirical uh, outward evidences after having temporarily dreamed about, you know, a lollipop sky castle where there's just unlimited free candy. Something that has no basis in reality. It's completely unreal, yet has a positive effect. And by the way, the most important things throughout all of human history, yeah, they, like hope, faith, love, hate, desire, these have moved and built the entire world that we live upon. These things cannot be quantized. They're not particle-based. It's impossible to say that. So electrical signals in the brain. It's like, oh, okay, let's talk about dielectric or electrostatic signals in the brain and uh, throughout human tissue. It's like, well, you've never explained that because you've never defined a field. You can't define a field. A field cannot be quantized unless you, of course, apply the uh, four Maxwellian field equations which vectorize a field over a period of time with a given result that can be quantized, such as joules, watts, volts, so on and so forth. But these people have never, ever, ever defined a field in itself, of itself, by itself, or the Greek word kora, field. That's the 800-pound elephant or 800-pound gorilla that sits on the back and shoulders of these people that, uh, that they don't want other people to see. It's like, you know, you're not actually a truth seeker. I say, like, what do you mean? I have a PhD it's hanging around the walls. Well, you're not. The most important thing in nature is a field, and you can't define it. A field cannot be by itself quantized. They have no idea. Because getting back to what I started out talking about, there's only ever been two postulates. One has been the ether, and the other one has been atoms. But you can't explain the universe with atoms. It's impossible. You can't explain the fact that 100% of this world of ours, both ancient, current, and future, is, uh, is uh, motivated, has its impulse from and by emotions. Hope, love, faith, desire, all these countless emotions, which cannot be quantized, which are not atoms, which are not things themselves. Here's another really important one. I should have put this one higher on the list. is power generation. When it comes to hydroelectric, or wind, or any AC generator, there is not a, uh, an exchange of one type of energy to another. In the case of any AC generator, whether it comes from coal, or nuclear, or uh, uh, wind, or hydroelectric, a condition is set up from a field arch geometry. Yes, that's all an AC generator is, a specific field arch geometry, which has a temporal component sets up the condition for the manifestation of energy. Yes? In the case of hydroelectric, no energy is exchanged from one to the other. In the case of wind, the wind is not transformed into energy. This is something insanely important that no high school or college ever taught you and certainly ever taught me. No AC generator actually generates energy. It makes energy manifest because it introduces a temporal variant with a dielectric reflector and a magnetic component. By the way, as I've said this many times, in most fundamental simplex, no one's ever said this before except for me, an AC generator is a magnet turned inside out. In the case of a magnet, not that this is a magnet, the magnetic field is uh, the centrifugal divergent and of course the plane of inertia sits right here and the dielectric of course is in counter space. You can see this if you put a magnet underneath a, a piece of magnetic viewing film uh, for example, an AC generator is literally an inside-out magnet where the magnetic field is on the inside and the dielectric reflector, the copper windings, are on the outside. And then a temporal, a temporal variable is introduced whereby which ether torsion is manifest and power is manifest. An AC generator does not generate electricity, does not generate power at all. Yes? It does not. The only thing that uh, nuclear hydroelectric, uh, coal burning, um, someone sets up a, you know, a water a power generator in their creek or a little waterfall. 
these are not being transformed into electricity. Sure, it's an AC generator. It's generating power. No, it's making manifest by the introduction of a temporal component, and an AC generator is just an inside-out magnet. You cannot explain power generation. Uh, these people actually say, by the way, too, this is very important. The AC generator is uh, generating X number of uh, voltage and uh, amps, so on and so forth, of electrons moving down the wires. And by the way, you can never, ever, and this is another proof of the ether, that these people can never, ever explain wireless power induction in a vacuum. It's completely 100% impossible. Because I said, the flow of power is the flow of electrons. Like I said, if you're a hammer, everything is a, uh, a nail. To these people, if you're an atomist, once again, everything is an atom. Well, electrons are not particles. There's not particles flowing down the power lines. By the way, the so-called discoverer of the electron, J.J. Thompson, you can look this up, by the way, he himself said the electron is not a particle. He said, and this is how he defined an electron, the discoverer of this phenomena, he says the, uh, the, the uh, concept of the electron is one unit of dielectric induction. So an electron is the quantized, yes, there we get the word quantum. One unit, and this is what quantum means too, by the way, the smallest unit. A unit is not nature. A unit is how human beings compartmentalize and count things. There's no such thing as quantum. Do you really understand that? Let me repeat that again because it's so important. Quantum is how we compartmentalize things, how human beings like to compartmentalize and count things. Mother Nature doesn't do that. She works off of fields and pressure mediation, centripetal divergence, centripetal convergence. Yes. So anyway, J.J. Thompson said the uh, principle of the electron is one unit of dielectric induction. You could never, ever explain wireless power induction with electrons and particles. It's completely impossible. Completely impossible. And this is where someone leaves a comment. So what about an electron microscope? Actually explaining that's easy. I think I've done it in about 50 videos. Yes? It's not difficult. There are so many proofs of the ether and yet people are so blind. You cannot explain this universe with particles and bumping particles. Quantum does not refer to anything in nature. Quantum is a unit of compartmentalization so that mathematicians who feign themselves to be scientists can count things. Can't count it? I don't believe in it. It's like religion. have to be able to count it. <laughs> it's okay. I got nothing against counting things. But these people cannot tell you what a field is. They have no idea what light is. Light's not an emission. It doesn't have a speed. That's the hysteresis of the ether, the rate of induction. AC generators do not generate power, they make it manifest. Well, where is this power coming from then? Because everybody on Earth, including me and you, are all taught this nonsense. Well, AC generators, you're doing converting wind energy to electricity. No, you're not. Wind is not transformed, kind of like water is transformed into ice by freezing it. It's like we start with it here and it gets transformed and it ends up over here. No AC generator turns hydroelectric into electricity. No AC generator has ever turned wind energy into electricity. No uh, nuclear power plants ever transformed those uh, uranium uh, rods into electricity. That's not the case at all, which all it does is heat water and create steam, and the steam turns a turbine. Well, is the steam actually being converted into electricity? Does anybody suffer that delusion? Not even a single scientist. Excuse me, Mr. Scientist. I know how a, a nuclear power generator works. Is the steam actually being... Actually, I believe a lot of them would say it is. Is the steam being transformed into energy when it goes into that super expensive mega million dollar... And I, there's neat videos I've seen of them when they take them apart for cleaning. Is the steam transformed into electricity? Yes, it is. I, I, I think actually a lot of them would say that it is. Yes, it is. The steam is transformed into electricity. It's like, Really? So there's like less steam on the output than there was on the input. Well, that's not the case. You have the exact, <laughs> you have the exact steam on the input to the generators you do on the output. There's no transformation there. Yeah, it's not like some sort of uh, Play-Doh maker or, or bake. Like I put in some dough and it rises and it becomes a cake. All the dough became a cake. That's what these people believe, and this is the stuff we were taught. It's not. The dough is not transformed into a cake, a nice fluffy cake to eat in the case of AC generators. It's not. There is a condition with the temporal variant for the manifestation 
of electricity. If ever there was a pure proof of the ether, this is it. That people are too blind to see the blatantly obvious is not my problem.